welcome to the Skeptic Zone, the podcast from Australia for science and reason. Hello and welcome to the Skeptic Zone, episode number 81 for the 7th of May 2010. Richard Saunders here with you once again. And today's show, well, Dr. Rachie and I went along to a very interesting uh, initiative here in Sydney, Art, Think and Play. This is by the Culture at Work, Culture at Work, interesting interplay with science and art. And uh, we popped along the other night and we heard a talk by Adam Hamlin about his research into neurons and lots of interesting pictures, followed by a talk by Melody Lord about her embroidery based on pictures of neurons from the brain. And then we saw her embroidery. That's coming up. We have a little bit of the the talk, followed by an interview with Adam and Melody. After that, the think tank. A very funny think tank this week, I think, with a very special bus announcement. Now, a few uh, little notes before we get started. Thank you for everybody who turned up to Sydney, Skeptics in the Pub, held uh, in the last week. What a wonderfully big turnout it was, and thanks, Maynard, for coming along too. Australian Skeptics are working hard on the details of TAM Australia. Don't forget that, coming up at the end of the year. More announcements on that. uh, I think we might even have some announcements during the Think Tank Of course, members of Australian Skeptics and the Skeptic Zone podcast will be winging over to Las Vegas to join Tam Vegas with James Randi and all our friends. If you're going to the amazing meeting this year in Las Vegas, make sure you uh, come over and say hello. And don't forget to check out the podcast from our very own Kylie Sturgis, the Token Skeptic. You can find that at uh, tokenskeptic.org. I don't know when Kylie sleeps. I I honestly don't. Not only is she a reporter for The Skeptic Zone, but she has her very own podcast, The Token Skeptic. And look out for Dr. Rachie's blog, The Skeptic's Book of Poo Poo, and Kylie Sturgis' blog, Pod Black. Now, you can uh, find those simply by going to skepticzone.tv, and you'll see the links there. An entertaining Skeptic Zone for you this week, so let's get into it. We take you now to Piermont here in Sydney for an initiative from Culture at Work. Art, Think and Play. A brief excerpt from the talk given to us by Adam Hamlin about his research into brain cells, followed by a brief excerpt from the talk given to us by artist Melody Lord, and after that, an interview with both of them with Dr. Rachi and myself. So the birth of neurons is a process that we call neurogenesis. And this is a great scientific story. It's one of those stories where there was a long-held belief about how the brain worked, and all of a sudden there was this data, and we had to change our minds. So there was this new data, we thought, hmm, okay. So for a long time we thought the number of brain cells you were born with, that was it. And they died throughout life, and they were never regenerated. And this is a picture I took of neurons in a part of the brain called the hippocampus, specifically the dendate gyrus, meaning the tooth. And these are cells that are two weeks old that have been born and they've been integrated into the nervous system. This is an area of the brain that's involved in learning and memory function. So like I said, for a long time we didn't even think that neurogenesis happened in the brain. Then in 1983, it was first found in the bird brain. So that old derogatory comment of calling someone a bird brain doesn't really work out. So what we've got here in blue is all the neurons in the brain, and in red they've shown new neurons that have been born in the bird brain. So this was in 1983. Then by the early 90s, neurogenesis had been discovered in pretty much all mammal species, including the human brain. Um, So it doesn't happen everywhere in the human brain, it happens in two specific areas. So one is called the subventricular zone, around the ventricles, the new neurons are born here and they migrate down and out into the olfactory bulbs. So in our sense of smell and stuff, there's always been neurons being born because these cells get exposed to the environment a lot and they 
it's a chemical, so they're always getting turned over. So we need new neurons coming into the olfactory bulb to keep our sense of smell working. There's also a second area called the hippocampus, and this is what the original photo was taken of. Um, so these new neurons being born in the hippocampus. This is an area that's involved in learning and memory function. So just quickly how this process happens, we have a whole lot of stem cells hanging around in the, in the subventricular zone and in the hippocampus. Now, that, most of the time they just stay as stem cells, but occasionally they get born with these neural precursor cells. And what happens is about half of these usually die, but then about half of them can go on to form neural, um, neural cells, of which there's a lot of types. They can become support cells, such as astrocytes and oligodendrocytes. Astrocytes are involved in transferring nutrients from the blood to the neurons because the neurons never actually come into contact with the blood. And then there's the oligodendrocytes as well. Now these form an insulation wire around the neurons to help fast transmission. And a percentage of them can also become neurons. So in the lab, this is the process we use to study neurogenesis. Uh, we usually harvest cells from an adult hippocampus, usually from a mouse. Uh, we differentiate these cells and we grow them up in a culture dish. And that way we can, we can study the process of what happens and what sort of things can we do to try and stimulate neurogenesis in these areas of the brain. And a few things we found is that antidepressants do this. Some hormones can stimulate neurogenesis as well. Um, after ischemia, so after a brain trauma, such as a stroke, can also get an upregulation of neurogenesis, potentially as a way of the brain trying to um, mend itself. Also, following voluntary exercise, which is really important. If you're forced to do exercise, you don't get the neurogenesis. <laughs> it has to be a voluntary action. <laughs> working with textiles is that you have such a wonderful choice of tactile and visually beautiful materials to express what you're trying to say and um, I just love that picture I want to just eat them like lollies <laughs> um, some of the threads I used were hand dyed silk threads which had um, gave a more organic quality to the colour and sometimes they were the um, just ordinary embroidery cotton like those ones, which gave a bit more vibrant colour. Um, the thing that I found with doing the works is that the works develop differently. You have to um, think about what you want to achieve when you start, choose your materials, plan out your process, but as it goes along, the, the materials teach you different things about what you want to to do next or where the work is going and often you end up with a completely different result at the end of it than you really thought you were going to get when you started. Um, so this is a bit more of the partly finished <coughs> work. Um, this work was uh, done with French knots and a little bit of, of padded satin stitch and it represents 40 hours of stitching and I know some people will ask that. I found it a very meditative practice to sit and make a French knot after French knot after French knot to choose the next colour to work with, to fill the space, um, which I did all visually by checking back against the original picture. And um, I thought a lot about what we know about the brain and what we don't know about the brain, which in my case is a lot less than what Adam knows about the brain. Um, but I think that any art form whether it's mark making on paper, music, dance, modern media, um, or embroidery, is a way of expressing knowledge and a search for knowledge. And that's what I feel that I was doing with the embroideries. Well, we're here in Sydney in Piermont, and the exhibition is called Kingdom of the Blind. It's a culture at work project, which is a wonderful idea of combining science with art, Dr. H. It is, and um, we're with our very special guests, Melody Lord. Hello, Melody. Hello. And Melody is the artist here tonight who has done all the embroidery, which was based on Dr. Adam Hamlin's wonderful neuroscience pictures. Hi, Adam. Hi, Rachel again. Good to see Good you to see again. You again. <laughs> yeah. 
down in Sydney this time. Yeah. So can you guys tell us a little bit about how this came to be? How is it that a scientist and an artist are working together on such a great project? Culture at Work is um, all about improving science education using art and creativity to encourage kids and adults to um, engage with the science. So that's how it combines, that if you, if you think through the science while you're engaging the creative part of your brain, it tends to go in better. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the uh, lay term. Now Adam can explain the <laughs> biology. Well, I don't know. It no, went in no, better no, for no. me tonight, I think. It was a wonderful presentation that you oh, did. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Rachel. What, what I tried to do with my presentation tonight was really show how science and art can be a really similar process. And when we're trying to gather data in neuroscience and we take these beautiful images, what we're mostly trying to do is gather data, but a really good byproduct of that is that we can get these beautiful images. And it's really nice that I've been able to inspire Melody's embroideries tonight and they just look fantastic. And hopefully we'll have some photos up of them somewhere. Well, they, they, they sell pictures just by themselves. It's a stagger. Yeah, just are. Almost something like Star Wars with the wonderful organic shapes, and it, it does remind one of the cosmos and the galaxies and things. Absolutely. Like Sometimes when you're looking down the microscope, it really reminds you of looking through a telescope. Mm. It's amazing mm. that the similar shapes are inside our brain and the processes are also out there in the universe. And speaking of telescopes, Adam, isn't that how you guys kind of met and that's, sort of started this collaboration? That's right. About five years ago, Melody and I met doing uh, adult education course in astronomy um, and then we sort of lost contact when I moved up to Queensland to start work at QBI and then Melody heard me interviewed uh, with Dr Rachie when we came up for when you guys came up for the Australian Skeptics Conference and Dr Rachie did the tour and Melody sent me an email and goes it was so lovely to hear your voice again <laughs> we should get together um, and I know this lady, Cheryl, that would be really interested in doing this science art project. I think we should get together. So, Melody, you're a sceptic owner. I am. I listen to it while I'm doing my embroidery. Well, there you go. That's fantastic. And let's just step over now and we can discuss a few of the wonderful pieces of embroidery that are hanging uh, here on the wall in this okay. exhibition. This one, let me uh, start with this, this one in the middle here, which is just, just a, a burst of wonderful colours. And can you explain that one for us? That one is based on an MRI image of a mouse brain showing the axonal connections and it's worked in French knots to represent the... Each French knot represents a bulb in the original image that shows a large or small connection. Um, that was... The original image was by Randall Muldrick at Queensland Brain Institute and took about 16 hours in the MRI machine to make. So it's very intricate, lots of French knots. It took me about 40 hours to stitch it. And um, what else do you want to know about it? <laughs> well, Adam, can you tell us a little bit about, yes. about from, the your, from the so, science? Sure. Yeah. So one of the reasons we take these really high-resolution MRI images is we're trying to capture disease in its really early processes. So if we're ever going to be able to treat... Uh, neurodegenerative diseases or diseases of the brain, we need to be able to detect them early. So we use these really high-powered MRI images to see if we can capture the very early stages of disease and we get these really beautiful and intricate and high-resolution images of the brain and we were able to detect a small amount of cell loss in early disease. So you were saying during your presentation this is one of the most powerful MRIs yeah, in the Southern Hemisphere? This, is, that this right? is the most powerful MRI machine in the Southern Hemisphere. It's a 16.4 Tesla. Um, for the physicists out there, they'll know what I'm talking about. Um, Do you know it's what one is of, really? it's one of the, <laughs> I'm it's, guessing. It's, it's one of the top five uh, in the world. Now, this is an experimental machine. Um, so to be able to image something in this machine, you need to be less than six centimetres big right. and you need to stay completely still for 16 hours. So it's purely an experimental machine. Um, so in the future, when the technology catches up, we'll be able to do this type of analysis on the human brain. 
And if people want to see the pictures, we're going to put them up. You have a blog, Melody, which we'll give you the address later, but we'll put the pictures up for our listeners. Let's discuss this one, which is right next to it, which I must admit, if you had this in your presentation, I had the duck out to feed the meter, unfortunately. It wasn't. It wasn't excellent. But as soon as I walked around the, the, the corner here and, and I had a look at this embroidery, uh, the first thing that, that struck me was a mouse maze, of course, and that's the whole idea, huh? Yes. Um, it actually started with one of the other works, which we'll probably discuss later, um, the, the brain structure called the dentate gyrus, which looks a little bit like a tail as well as a tooth. And because it's from a mouse brain, I was thinking about mice and tails. And I remembered a book that I'd read as a teenager called Flowers for Algernon, which is, um, was very popular in the 1970s about... Uh, a young man who, with below average intelligence who he gets involved in an experiment, becomes a genius. And I remember, you remember that, that movie. He became super smart, didn't yes. he? Yes. And that's right. And he had a friend called Algernon who was a mouse yes, who, yes. who had had the same pro- process. It was totally fictional, but it's a very moving story about the way um, intelligence works and about the way science works too. Yeah. They asked um, him what, what he saw about the future and he said a TV in every room. He wasn't wrong, was he? <laughs> <laughs> yes. So that's where I got the inspiration for the maze embroidery because I was thinking about mice and tails and um, the tail of the mouse in Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland where it goes in the shape of a tail down the page. Yeah. Um, so there were lots of thoughts that went into that one. But, yeah, it's, it's stunning. I mean, it, it really does say a lot. And you were saying before, and one of the things I was commenting is I really like the story behind the artwork. Now, let's just step over to the other side of the exhibition here. And I must admit, I like them all, but this one really did catch my attention uh, because of the little story involved. Would you like to discuss that one? Um, well, this one is based on the dentate gyrus in a mouse's brain. It's one of Adam's images of neurogenesis or cell birth. Um, which he can probably tell you more about. But the idea behind the image is that it's a fairly um, abstract representation of the way new brain cells grow and make connections in the brain tissue. So the stitches around the tooth-shaped or the tail-shaped central part reach out towards the other cells in the brain, which are depicted in the embroidery. It also struck me as something almost uh, like a primitive culture's artwork. Can you see that? what I mean? Yes. With, yeah. the, with the patterns and everything there. But I love the fact that it's telling a story as well. Well, a lot of embroidery traditionally comes from that background. It starts as a natural form which um, people represent in stitches on their clothing or on, on practical items to make them beautiful. And um, I think that this one works in the same way. It takes just a, an image from nature, although it's a microscope image, and just turns it into a design that can speak to you in a different way. It's, it was also interesting, too, and something I'd like to briefly discuss with you, Adam, as you were saying in your talk about the myth of cell death in the brain. Once the, the brain cells die, that's it, which is something I certainly grew up believe it. Yeah, I mean, neurogenesis is one of those great scientific stories where a long-held scientific belief has just had to be thrown out because new data has come along and we've had to completely rethink how the brain works. Yeah. Like for a long time, ever since the days of Cajal and early neuroscience, it was thought that the number of cells that you were born with was all you were going to have for the rest of your life. Then in 1983... It was first found in a bird brain, actually, that there was these new cells that were being born in the brain. So we completely had to rethink, and then people started looking into mammals and other mammals. And then by the early 90s, neurogenesis had been found in most mammal species, including the human brain. So new neurons are being born in your brain all the time. There's and hope then, for us all, Dr. Rachel. There is. And you also had some interesting information, Adam, about how antidepressants can actually encourage uh, neurogenesis and also exercise. When you say exercise, do you mean exercise in your brain or your body? No, I mean your body. Right. So we, we're trying to understand things that can stimulate this process in the brain. So it, neurogenesis doesn't happen all over the brain. It happens in two specific regions of, of the brain. There's one called the subventricular zone and they supply new cells to your olfactory cortex. So 
where we smell. And we think the reason that this is is because these cells are so exposed to the environment and chemicals, so they need to get turnover all the time. So in another area of the brain, in the hippocampus, which is involved in learning and memory, we've also shown that there's these new cells being born and integrated into the circuitry. Um, so what was the question? So what, was the question? <laughs> <laughs> what is the mechanism of neurogenesis? Okay, so we're trying to study um, what sort of things can we stimulate, particularly these dendrite gyrus ones or these hippocampal ones because they're involved in learning and memory. And what we've shown in our laboratory is that antidepressants can stimulate this. This may be one mechanism about how they're working to improve people's outlook, potentially. Mm. I mean, we, we don't know that for sure. We don't know what the functional outcome of this neurogenesis is yet, but we just know antidepressants can stimulate it. Uh, certain hormones can also stimulate it. And exercise, interesting physical exercise, but it must be voluntary, which is really interesting. So if... You want to go out for a run. It, it needs to yeah. be rewarding and... Right. You need to be motivated to do it. <laughs> if we stick a mouse on uh, on a treadmill mm. and make it run, we get no neurogenesis. If we stick a running wheel in the cage, then we get great neurogenesis. Wow. Oh, so if you give them the option of using it. If they it. have the option and they do run, they love to run. Right. But if they choose to run, then they get neurogenesis. So the lesson for our listeners, Richard, is... Get on that treadmill. And but only if you want to. Only if you want to. Just lastly, can we talk about the apoptosis um, embroidery melody? Because I absolutely love this one. It this looks one? like, yes. a, yes. looks like a galaxy or something, doesn't it? These, once again, are quite um, abstract designs rather than, rep- than visual representations. But um, basically, the, if you look at the three of them as a set, the first one, the um, stitches are all connected and they go in rows and they're quite ordered. Um, and put together. The second one, you can see the chaos of the dying cells. The stitches are not connected. The background's very messy, and um, but it's not messy, I suppose. <laughs> uh, it's yeah, it's chaotic, and so you can see the the destruction of the cells there. And then the third one in the series. Um, which is based on Adam's image that shows only a few living cells, is quite blank except for a, a Right, a few right, yes, stitches. the three in context makes yeah. sense, yes. Yeah. So the first one is somewhat ordered, ordered. Yeah. the yeah. second one is... Very chaotic. Chaotic, and the third one is very simplistic. Yes. A middle, min, minimalist. But I think there's a bit of hope in that third one because the cells that remain are still connected, so... It's not all bad news. Now, by now, our listeners are just dying to see what we're talking about. Where can they run with their fingers on the internet to have a look? Um, our blog is at culture at work, all one word, hyphen Hamlin hyphen Lord dot blogspot dot com. Right. I hope you'll put a link to that because it's hard to remember. We will. We will. To it. <laughs> we will. And the works are all on there in one form or another. I'll put up um, finished pictures of them soon. And there's also some of your microscopy up there, Adam. Yeah, so the, the images that inspired Melody's embroideries are also on the blog, so if people want to check that out. And a description of how Adam created them and what they represent to, from Adam is on there too. Well, what a wonderful project, you guys. I'm so inspired. It was so fantastic to see science and art, which I always have thought should be together because I come from an art background, but to actually see it come together in such a great exhibition was fantastic. Thank you for coming. Yeah, thank you. It was thank a lot you. of fun today. Thanks, yeah, guys. I enjoyed it. Astronomy Cast takes a facts based journey through the cosmos as it offers listeners weekly discussions on astronomical topics ranging from planets to cosmology. Hosted by Fraser Kane of Universe Today and myself, Dr. Pamela Gay of Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville. This show brings the questions of an avid astronomy lover directly to an astronomer. Together, Fraser and I explore what is known and being discovered about the universe around us. Join us each week as we take a facts-based journey through the cosmos at astronomycast.com. Join us now for Drinking Skeptically in the Think Tank. Oh,
you children have left. Cheers, everybody. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> More of a clunk than a clink. <laughs> Goodness me, how many people are here tonight? <laughs> oh, you over there, cheers! <laughs> <laughs> all, right, all the rest of you can go home now. We'll just stick with what we have here. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Joining me... <laughs> oh, dear. You should see what's going on here, folks. Joining me in the think tank tonight, in our favourite club, down the street in the Chinese restaurant along, along the back wall, Iran Segev. Hello, Iran. Hello, Richard. We also have our favourite Diane Verstappen. Hello, Diane. Hi, Richard. Hi, how do you say hello in Dutch? Hello. Hello. <laughs> Whoa. Hoi. Oh, so Hoi. exotic. Ahoy. <laughs> and Diane will be giving us some more Dutch words throughout the evening. <laughs> right. Some of them not nice, probably. <laughs> Ah, oh, yes, Nurse Jo Benamu. Hello, Jo. Hi, Richard. Hi, Jo. I like your little brochy thing oh, you Oh, thank wearing. you, thank you. It's very artistic. But very, um, not, not appropriate for a uh, podcast, is it? No, not Me really. podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Rachie. Bonjour. <laughs> Bonsoir. <laughs> Poffin. Yeah. That's German. We're having a linguistically diverse think tank tonight. We are, and Naran's going to say something in Hebrew. Ma? <laughs> Go on. Ma, <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. I could give you some Zulu. <laughs> some Zulu? <laughs> well. <laughs> oh, damn it. Sagborna. What's that mean? Hello. Oh, How are okay. you? There you go. I think we should get on with the think tank now, actually. We've so. stopped. A lot of editing work to do. Yes. <laughs> no, no, heavens above, no. Uh, look, just uh, something that caught my eye before we get into the interesting topics of the week. Walking into the, our club tonight, on the wall there are two ads, two posters for upcoming psychic events. Oh, yes. I think they put them up when they know we're coming. Richard. They do, I think, just to annoy us. I think they also put them up when they know we're not coming, unfortunately. Yeah, I think they just have a lot of psychic events and it's oh, exactly. they do. Yeah. Yeah. We have uh, a psychic festival coming up in June or July, I think. So they have one every six months, like Mind Buddy Wallet down down uh, downtown. And they've also got a special one day um, psychic workshop. Only you only a hundred dollars. Only only a hundred dollars. Do you know what I? They, I always with these I evenings. I always want to see. I want to once once in my life have uh, put my hands on the letter of invitation to a psychic, like a letter that invites them to join such a psychic festival or something. Yeah. Oh, I see. It's just it would be just the irony is just overwhelming. <laughs> Don't open that letter. I know what's inside. Um, speaking about psychics, let's just rattle off uh, in what I've gathered is the four big biggies for the year so far, four big events that they've all missed, starting off with the Haiti earthquake, the volcano, which no one can pronounce the name of in Iceland, which is still causing trouble. At, at Colvinius, can. Oh. In fact, he won an award on Media Watch last week for being able to do it. We'll just say the Icelandic volcano. You all know what I mean. Again, causing trouble. The Chilean earthquake. Was that this was that was this no. year? Was it? Was no. that this year? Ha- or last year? Haiti. Haiti was this year. Yeah, I think. Ch- the Chile one was this year as well. Whenever the Chile one was, it wasn't predicted. Right. It wasn't. Um, the oil spill yep. in the United States, which they're saying is one of the biggest uh, oil disasters. I believe it's now gone. It's it's more than the um, Exxon Valdez now. Is it really? Yes. It's huge, yeah. I, it was on the news again. A huge story. Hello. I mean, and um, as a side note, Australia has a new uh, sporting champion, world snooker champion. Oh, yeah. I heard about that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you didn't hear about that from the psychics? No. no. Stephen Fry told me that. Stephen Fry told you. Oh, that's yeah. very clever. I think it was uh, one, of, they didn't, one of our... Uh, they also didn't predict Rach would be name-dropping. No. <laughs> Already dropped Colvinius and Stephen Fry. I can't remember who it was that pointed out that um, we we're actually mistaken by referring to this as an oil spill. An oil spill is when a bunch of oil falls out of a ship, as opposed to what's going on when a massive it's oil rig, from the ocean. which which I imagine would be it's a, a far slick. It's a slick. It's yeah, a slick. but but I mean I would imagine it would be a much greater proportion anyway than a spill. Should be the, just the volume yeah, of yeah, oil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know much. All right, and before I, I, I uh, pass over. 
uh, pass the microphone over to uh, Dr. Aichi and, and Joe. You're not going to pass over right I'm here. I'm not going to pass right? over right here. The food was pretty good, actually. <laughs> okay. I assure you, the food was fine. Um, listeners in the mid-north coast area or the north coast area of New South Wales, yeah. around Nambucca Heads in the Nambucca Valley, you can hear portions of the Skeptic Zone, including Grain of Salt and Dr. Rachi and some other things, on Radio 2 NVR FM, and that's 105.9 on your FM dial. They are uh, replaying parts of the Skeptic Zone on uh, public radio, so that's really good. Excellent. That's yeah. excellent. And thank you to the people there at uh, Radio 2 NVR FM, Dr. H. Yes, Dr. Richard. Uh, Nurse Joe and I um, are poring over some literature at the moment, which I was alerted to last night on Twitter by Professor David Cahoon. Now, there I go, name dropping again. <laughs> you mean Big nurse, smile. You mean Nurse Joe? Yes, Nurse Joe, at Joe <laughs> Benamou. Um, is that right, at Dr. A.G.? It is, at Skeptic Zone. And, oh, look over there, there's at Diane underscore. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the only one who's boring. <laughs> just me. At me. You don't tweet. I'm also an at me. Anyway, um, (laughs) I, what, basically what we're looking at is a document for the, um, what's it called, Joan? National National Institute of Complementary Medicine. Yeah, the National Institute of Complementary Medicine, which I only discovered last night, Mm. um, exists in Australia. Yes, I I was actually quite stunned to realise I didn't know this existed in Australia. Well, I dug up the information from the website last night when I was doing some Googling for another reason, Um, and upon reading the background of it, I realised that I did know this was happening here, but Mm. for our international listeners, this is kind of the Australian equivalent of NCAM, Mm -hmm. which is the National Centre for Complementary and Alternative Medicine, set up by the NIH in the States. Um, and they've been criticised a lot because um, they've already spent $2.5 billion mm. since their um, setting up and so far they've pretty much found nothing, nothing. useful. Mm. Mm. So this was instigated because in 2006 the Chinese government announced they were going to put significant amounts of money into international collabor- collaborative research uh, and Basically, they sent out a message across the world saying we want more research done on Chinese medicine because we want it more widely accepted because the Chinese themselves have come under mm. a lot of criticism mm. for research. You know, the reason I'm laughing is because, again, it's the goal thing. The goal is not to find out whether it works so we can know whether to use it or not because we want it accepted. I know, yeah. I know. It's, it's absurd. Yeah. The whole premise is, is the problem. Well, the, because the Chinese have been heavily criticised for research into Chinese medicine mm-hmm. and... So, um, the Australian government took advantage of the fact that the Chinese were giving out all this money and um, the National Medical Health and Medical Research Council, or the NHMRC, that's our government body who hands out uh, research research grants, grants. they, in 2006, took a special initiative to hand out five million bucks to people who wanted to become involved in um, researching CAM. Can I be involved? If you want to put in a grant, sure. Uh, yeah. For five million bucks, I will. Well, you don't get you all of that. All they've, got to, they've got to <laughs> split it up. But, but yeah, I, and I remember hearing about this because I remember hearing that the New South Wales government was going to put in $4 million towards mm. building a specialised independent facility, which at the time I thought was going to be part of the University of Sydney. It turns out it's at the University of Western Sydney. Mm. Um, and the Office of Science... Um, OSMR, Office of Science and Medical Research Council, which is a state-run science sort of outreach body, they gave six hundred thousand dollars towards this project. Mm, mm. Now money, I was money, money. Yeah, just being mm. thrown at it. And I remember when I heard about this because I actually happened to be at a dinner with an MP, a member of Parliament who was involved in giving out this funding, and I was asking them why they were putting all this money into this project. Anyway, so that's the background, but it, but it turns out that this is, yeah, the National Centre, um, the National Institute of Complementary Medicine. It's based at the University of Western Sydney, 
And Joe, do you want to talk a little bit about who's behind it and what they do? Yeah, look, it, it's, there's actually a lot of interesting stuff when you when you get down to what's going on here and who's involved and so on. And look, when, I, I can't name any any names off the top of my head, but a lot of the people involved are people with you know significant um, scientific and research backgrounds in medicine and so on. And there there are a lot of very reputable people involved. Um, one name I did note, however, was uh, on their one of their advisory councils, and that's uh, Dr. Karen Phelps, Professor Karen Phelps, who we've spoken about before, um, and she is actually the recipient of one of the grants uh, for some research through her uh, clinic which itself is a promoter and uh, a user of complementary medicine. And the specific grant, in fact, goes towards... It's a bit of a, a, an interesting thing that they're researching. Um, okay, so, uh, so Professor Phelps uh, is on one of their advisory committees, as I said, and uh, they're doing a study um, into... An, it's called an appraisal of health services data and outcome measurement tools for use in an Australian primary care integrative medicine setting. And, uh, I mean, really, I, I think what they're looking at is um, what, doc, what Professor Phelps is very heavily promoting, which is bringing complementary therapies into medical practices. And it's something that her clinic is actually doing. Now, the thing is, and this is, this is the problem I have with a lot of what this, uh, this institute is doing, they, I have no problem as it stands with research being done into herbal medicines, into, you know, a lot of the practices that they're looking at as complementary medicine or whatever you want to call it. I've got no problem with research being done into it if it's good, rigorous research. What I have a problem with is that on the one hand, there are some sides of this institute which seem to be really addressing the issues of rigour, of, of good methodology, of doing good research but on the other hand they are dabbling and mixing with some areas within complementary therapies which at face value in terms of things like prior plausibility can be thrown out the window like homeopathy now their their main research grants are not going towards anything like that their research grants are going into things which you could say are reasonable Research into, for example, the use of certain medicines, uh, certain herbal medicines in dementia and things like that. And yes, fair enough, I can see why they would want to do that research, but when they're then associated along with something like homeopathy or therapeutic touch, things which have resoundingly been demonstrated to be no more effective than placebo and to have absolutely no merit whatsoever, mm. then I think that they're completely destroying any credibility. This is one of the things that Steve Novella was talking about recently uh, when he had a meeting with one of the directors of NCAM mm-hmm. in the yeah. States. Yeah. Um, and the new director there was saying, well, we haven't grant, given grants for homeopathy for four years, yeah. but they still haven't, like, you know... Um, cut it out of their options no no you know? exactly so that it's like they're leaving the door open yeah and they've still got this association with these organizations and this can be seen very clearly when you look at um so they've got here uh professional associations and really the way i took this was that this is a list of modalities that they are aligned with in terms of research and it's an extensive wait a minute wait a minute i just looked at diane's face she's looking over your shoulder (laughs) what is it diane oh just the list of stuff on on there it's just ridiculous reiki tai chi great how much money do they are they getting (laughs) homeopathy bowen therapy aromatherapy I'll tell you, and but so you see, on. the thing is they're using credible scientists like Karen Phelps, who's an award-winning scientist. In fact, she won a very important award in yes, 2008. She did. She did. She did. <laughs> <laughs> she was getting the, 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 award. Yes, yeah. exactly. <laughs> She's a good company, though, because Meryl Dory won that too. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, but the researcher. Oh, yeah. She's, no, she's Australia's most respected um, expert on vaccination. Didn't yes. you know that? Yeah, she said she was a, a um, what is it, a mother researcher and... Uh, I, public policy advocate oh, she has a brain that's all yeah. she said mm. I mean yeah on that Joe, there are the, the people who are on the advisory committee um, 
uh, yeah, some very, very well-respected mm. and decorated, highly decorated scientists. Mm. Um, and the reason that I found this was because Professor David Cahoon in the UK mm-hmm. found that there's a guy on the scientific advisory also committee called, called David Cahoon. Professor David no, Cahoon. Really? Yes. <laughs> That's why we, we got in touch with me. Now, he's actually a cardiologist uh, who has, runs a private practice in, in Brisbane, mm. but he's doing, um, apparently coordinating over 20 trials at the moment mm. into things like lipids, nutrition, nutraceuticals, psychological aspects of heart disease, diabetes and obesity. Mm. And he's running a trial to see at the moment if, um, what does he say, it? deliberate weight reduction reduces cardiovascular events. Now, there's no more details about that study, so I don't know what endpoints they're looking at. I guess cardiovascular events would be if you die. Well, <laughs> yeah, cardiovascular <laughs> events would be any could be any sort of uh, yeah a, 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 a heart attack, uh, Angina, you know, uh, arrhythmia. Stroke, yeah, yeah, yeah. But Rachel, the, the, one of the things that really struck me, in fact, there were a lot of things as I as I sort of t- tore through this that really concerned me. Huh? You finished two markers there, didn't you? I did. I did. You know me and my highlighters. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I had a great time. I even pulled out a pen and I made notes. Anyway, um, you know, the, the, the buzzwords in healthcare these days are really important to think about when looking at what an organisation like this is doing. And they, one of the very first things they talk about is... Um, that Australia is facing escalating health costs and they talk you know you always hear in healthcare talking about things like aging populations and you know people who the number of people who have multiple comorbidities and things like that and at some level I look at this and my alarm bells start ringing because I think you know are we investing money in this because we're trying to find cheap and easy ways of managing health in a way that we're just not able to manage anymore and providing effectively placebo health care for the chronic illnesses which we just don't have the money to invest in effectively because that really is a huge problem. Primary health care is something that is completely underfunded and it is vitally important in, you know, in, in terms of what we need to decrease the, the, um, the impact of illness on the acute care system and something like this can be viewed as primary health care by a lot of people who are looking at ways to fix the problem um, and that's something I find really worrying that uh, you know this type of therapy can be used sense, in that way this kind of thing without doing anything practical is lending some credibility to these to these exactly. modalities yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, one of the guys on the advisory committee is um, the, de- the deputy director of NCAM, the NIH mm. one. Mm. So it's mm. all tied up to that as well. Did you say, Rachie, that this is called the National... What is it? National Inter- Institute of Complementary Medicine. Medicine. Or yeah. NICM for short. NICM, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's They right. all should just be Nick Nick $5 million. Yeah, uh, the other thing that I found quite interesting was... Um, they talk a lot about the things that we value in science, about um, you know rigorous research, rigorous methodologies, all, all the things that we talk about. But then they, in, in terms of their research priorities, they say um, the priorities are research that investigates methodological issues relevant to the complex, complex nature of complementary medicine including development of methodological tools which may impact on our understanding of the whole practice concepts and mechanisms underpinning complementary medicine. Now, I understand that in terms of, you know, doing research into any modality that, yes, you do have to develop measurement tools and things like that that are appropriate for that particular thing. But that also says to me it, it, it's that whole idea that people involved in this kind of thing talk about that somehow complementary medicine can't be investigated in using the same science as other medicine. Yeah, because it doesn't that work it's different. When you do yeah. it, right? Exactly. And, that, and so it's sort of, you know, are, are we looking at a way to invent a whole new science to give to open doors for this rather than, you know... No, but yeah, yeah, only, but the, the thing is, it, it's only, you only need special science when the re- regular science doesn't work. Yeah. yeah, yeah. They're they're more than happy exactly. to adopt the results when. Have they released any studies? Any results? Have, is there anything that has come out of it? 
Um, I didn't actually I didn't have a chance to look anything. No. Uh, that that I would be interesting to, yeah, to contact them and say, what have you come up with so yeah, far? Yeah. Yeah. I don't. I don't remember if there was a tab mm. for. I remember there was one tab that was completely blank, but I don't remember what yeah, it was. I mean, it's a pretty. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. No, that was the positive yeah. result. Yeah. <laughs> the other thing I have to say that gave me a little bit of a chuckle. It was a bit of a huh moment. Was um. I don't know if you actually looked at their definition of complementary medicine, but they give a definition yeah, of did. complementary and a definition of medicine. And their definition of... Phew, well, their definition of complementary is forming a complete or balanced whole. Oh, good. Now, I'm sorry, is but the last time that? I checked, <laughs> that's not what... Can you create a complete and balanced whole using a bullet? I think, uh, do you know I think what that's I, probably a pretty good Do you know what do I also that, think right? is interesting about this, Joe, is they have st- um, stayed away from using the term alternative. They have. they have. And I'm pretty sure that's deliberately. So they've just called themselves the National Institute of Complementary Medicine, mm-hmm. which means our modalities will complement conventional exactly. medicine. We'll give conventional medicine a little help. Yeah. yeah. But but they do. I mean, you, if you read through their stuff, every now and then you'll find a, you know, they've dropped one like here. They've got wellness promotion. Yeah. Wellness. yeah. So, you know, they go from all this very scientific terminology into um, we're, we're going to... You're insinuating that wellness is not a scientific term. Yes, I am. But but this sentence is they want to facilitate discussion and, um, and do preliminary work to complete much as possible in the areas of cancer, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, neurological disorders, brackets, dementias, and wellness promotion. Mm. That's like the, there's a, a company advertising on TV um, um, some sort of pill that will give you back the zest... Oh, gosh. Take this pill and you'll have more zest. Right. So That's you get a more scientific term. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I don't know right. if you saw this page, which was their page of facts and statistics. And I, I was really amused by this one. Um, so they say here uh, that two in three Australians use complementary medicine each year. And they then say that almost four times more is spent on complementary medicine than on pharmaceuticals. Now... In, in brackets, they also say so in out-of-pocket expenses. Ah. Now, I mean, obviously that's because you've got the PBS, you've got yeah, drugs are drugs that are actually covered by the government. By the government. The drugs that work anyway. Exactly. But, but you know what they'll cover in complementary medicine? They'll, uh, I, I go along every now and then and have a nice uh, Thai massage down, down oh, the road. yeah, I'm sure. And I bet Absolutely. they would say, did, did you have a, a, a massage? Yeah, okay, you use complementary medicine. Well, the thing is, though, that they've cited these statistics. But there isn't a single source for any of them. I, I don't know where they got this data from. They say that, um, you know, complementary medicine users have healthier lifestyles and 73% have, you know, minimum serves of fruit and vegetables. Because these as are opposed, people who can afford to waste money on complementary Exactly. Medicine. We know that because we know that about the people who use it. So, you know, but, but they don't source any of this. And I, and I think that, you know, it's... it's anyway, so, yeah, they're... Um, they're looking for, for data. Their, their whole idea is to look for data, but they're not even providing evidence for their own statistics, which I find quite cool. Uh, there's money in them mm. that are complementary medicine. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That there is. So any of our listeners who... Um, somebody actually tweeted back to me last night that they study on that campus and they didn't know it exists. So if you anyone who's um, studying at UWS, and actually Rachel Welsh, who listens to the show, go check it out and tell us what's going on in the bunkers of the <laughs> Nickham. <laughs> oh, but that's, that's the thing, actually. Uh, just, you know, with, with the fact that UWS is the university that is um, ally, uh, aligned to this, UWS is one of the universities in Australia that carries a, a large number of the, the degree courses in things like Chinese medicine, naturopathy. I mean, various, I'm not sure if it's naturopathy, but in a lot of these okay. practices. So, there you go. Woo! Woo! Uh, another mention by me, quickly. Don't forget, listeners, that uh, you can hear the skeptics, Dr. Rachie, myself, Dr. Chrissy, and anybody else. Joe, I hope you'll be fronting along soon. Around, you're always welcome on Radio 2GB here in Sydney. That's 873 on the AM dial, uh, usually every second Saturday or so. But we'll certainly let you know via Twitter when that's happening with our good friend and, uh, Glenn Wheeler. And, of course, Iran. And on uh, Sunday, uh, this Sunday, 9th of May at 8.45 Sydney time, um, I will be on Radio National um, speaking on the program named Occam's Razor. And if it's about 
assessing evidence. Okay, and if listeners don't happen to, uh, they can if they can't, if they, of course, if they can't tune in or if they're uh, out of area for for this uh, radio station, they can download it um, later that morning from ABC. Dot net dot au, Radio National's uh, website. And iTunes. And through iTunes, yes. And Richard, I've had some listeners ask where they can get the podcasts of our 2GB show. Have you amalgamated them uh, somewhere? No, no. We, so we usually, not always, we usually get to record our when we're on 2GB. I've got about four or five of them kicking around my computer. We put one or two up online. But generally speaking, they're not really anywhere. Mm. Um, you can hear them anywhere in the world while we're doing them on 2GB.com. Yeah, but that wasn't my question. I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, if we get enough people requesting it, maybe we, we can, I'll, I can collate what we have to make them available. Okay. So, you, so yes, Joe, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you'll have to phone up and be on. Uh, and that, that radio program we're on is actually about to go semi national. Yeah, it is. It's, it's, it's going to be re, uh, we'll, we'll syndicated through Melbourne. So that's pretty cool. Fantastic. Uh, I have another announcement. Are we in the announcement stage now? So, yeah, let's yeah, announce okay. something. So, um, I'd like to announce on, a um, so on Thursday. announcement. <laughs> Anybody else? On um, Thursday, the 13th of May, I will be speaking to Canberra Skeptics. Ah. Um, will they be listening, I wonder? I'm sure some of them will be. It's at uh, six, I think six p.m. for a seven p.m. start. So there's like dinner and stuff, and then the the talk is at seven p.m. And it's at the lecture theatre, the Innov- Innovations Building, Eggleston Road, ANU. What what was that date again? The f- the thirteenth of May. Thirteenth of May, the Canberra Skeptics uh, listeners in that area go along, and, and you can hear Ron get his autograph. Woohoo! Uh, Google Canberra Skeptics, and you can find out more. I'm sure. And, uh, Ron, I think we've got some uh, TAM Australian news as well. Yes, we do. We have uh, two speakers that we're going to add to the list of advertised speakers. We've got more exciting guests yeah. in the list, but we can announce that two of our friends here at uh, the Skeptic Zone will be participating, will be in the speaker role. Dr. Rachi and Dr. Chrissy will Yay! both be in the role. <laughs> So, Dr. Rachi, uh, that's very exciting. You're going to be one of the speakers at TAM Australia. It is very exciting. I'm very excited. Yes. Are you? <laughs> on an A380. Oh, that would be that would be oh. cool. That would be cool. <laughs> if you can arrange that, even if you have to go around the world first, that's fine. I see. I don't mind. All right. Yeah. Can we get it to land right outside the SMC centre? Mm. Do you reckon? Do you reckon it can? Do you think it would center. fit? That's like pin number. <laughs> 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 me no. You're uh, onto me. <laughs> however, we are um, <laughs> we are working very hard uh, on details for Tam Australia, and hopefully, before too long, we should be able to direct people to our permanent website. Yes, yeah, that's coming soon. Right. It's coming. It's uh, coming. And also, it's we will on. be uh, keep your eyes and ears and um, everything else open for uh, well, not quite everything else. Um, senses <laughs> only senses. <laughs> Open for news about when we will be selling tickets because it's coming. It's coming soon. soon. Yeah, that, that, I'll be lining up. Will you? <laughs> for the food. Can you get one for me? <laughs> it's okay. Oh, for the food. For the food. For the noms. And so let me swing the microphone around Hope again. Now you all appreciate this this lazy Susan lazy I bought. Susan. It's got the microphone sitting on it, so if I swing it around, it's facing you, Joe. <gasps> Lady Why, Susan's you. one of my favourite bands, actually. Oh. They're a really good Sydney band. If, I wonder if foreign the listeners know what a Lazy Susan is. Do a Google search. Is it an Australian mm. term? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> now, for some reason, the girls are cracking up because of la- the Lazy Susan I'm using. Go, go ahead, Joe. You've got something to <laughs> um, So, um... I got an iPhone recently, so I've been exploring the world of apps. And, oh, uh, there's an oh, app for that. What fun. There's an app for that, isn't there? Um, so apparently, I've just discovered today that uh, Apple have apparently booted an STD psychic healing app off their list of apps. Really? <laughs> what? <laughs> Indeed, I hear you say. Um, according to this uh, little piece I found online... Uh, Apple has decided that psychic healing has no place in the App Store, despite last week approving a distance healing application for warts. What? For twelve ninety nine. Apparently, 
people who bought my party, people who bought a copy oh. of Wart Healer were asked to take <laughs> <laughs> were asked to take a photograph of their wart, <laughs> which is sent to the professional mental healer. He spends the next, and I quote, right. 111 days thinking about it, after which oh. the first effects are visible. It was approved on the 22nd of April, but was pulled this week by Apple. What if the award's in a personal place? Well, That's what he hopes. <laughs> then, then we'll find it on embarrassing illness. <laughs> That's your favourite show, isn't it? It Joe? is. It is. <laughs> it's, actually, it's actually probably a bit of um, a bit of um, um, for for Joe, based, you know, depend, because of her job. <laughs> Uh, embarrassing illnesses is kind of a bit of a bit of a bit of a relief. No, <laughs> it's, 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 a rest, it's a respite. Yeah. It's a respite. <laughs> but anyway, I found it rather amusing that Apple had chosen to get rid of this, given the fact that, uh, in fact, there are many apps out there within the health and medical section yeah, which are yeah. entirely quackery. Based. I've got a, homeo- a homeopathic advice uh, mm. app. I've got an astrology app. Oh yeah, yeah. Apparently, there's a crystal healing bowl to excite your chakras. Oh, how exciting! Are your chakras excited? <laughs> <laughs> They're vibrating. They are. Mm. My chakras are excited too. Mm. Why because, is that? because Andrew Wakefield's written a book. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Run for the hill. Now, somebody on Twitter today said that they were really pleased to see this because he's always been very good at fiction or something, and it's a <laughs> <laughs> his first foray into fiction. It's actually not published yet, but it's called Callous Disregard, and it's the story of his. You know, about calluses. Downfall, I guess. Do you know that Jenny McCarthy does the foreword and actually gives the, the end away? The foreword? <laughs> I didn't know that. I know that she did the foreword. <laughs> does the ship sink? Yes. <laughs> does she, what do you mean she gives the end away? <laughs> you don't get it. Oh. Because it's Jenny McCarthy? <laughs> Yeah, right, so he's gone he's so far gone. on the dark side. Purple? <laughs> Usually you go bright red. <laughs> but actually, it's actually it's red. It's actually red to go red. But I'm not, am I? <laughs> you know, you have gone purple. <laughs> you have. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> no, it's okay. No, I'm sorry, I'm a bit slow, but I get it now. Um, yeah, so it's, I don't know when it's, do you know when it's released? I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay. But, um, because you might be stripped if you <laughs> So, so we, we, look, we look forward to reading his side of the story, I guess. Oh, I'll, I'll get it. You've still got my Jenny McCarthy book. Have you read it yet? Yes. It was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't really want to read it. No, I'll, I'll, well, I bought that one that I lent you for five dollars in the bargain bin in New York City. So I'll probably wait for Wakefields to appear in the bargain bin. You see, I've just buy. noticed a bit of a trend here. Yeah, yeah, I'll wait a whole week. We, you, I give you, you know, nice anti-woo books. You throw at us things like Fran Sheffield's Homeopathy Plus <laughs> DVDs and Jenny McCarthy's book. You're trying to, you're trying to torture us. <laughs> don't, don't forget second opinion. Oh, oh that's the worst thing ever. <laughs> All right. I, I, you know, one day I think we should um, live stream this thing take on a video. No. No? <laughs> and people can see what colours you're turning, Diane. And they can see you, Rachel and Joe, cack themselves silly and nearly fall off their chairs. There's just one problem with that idea. What's that? You can't edit live streams. No. no. Uh, better not. Then no, we won't. And uh, a big apology... It seems the club of, has let us down. No bus announcements this week. Oh no! Yeah. There we were can no make an, uh, bus Come on, announcements. make one, Richard. Make one. Come on, yeah, bus announcement, Richard. Uh, members and guests, the next <laughs> bus to Helston Park and Canterbury will be leaving in five minutes. There you are. <laughs> Very good. <That's> pretty <laughs> you know what the problem is now? If you what? leave that in, yeah. people will think that that's that's always you. <laughs> <very good. laughs> I no. promise it's not. No. Iran Segev, thank you so much for making your way all the way over here for the Think Tank again. Thank you, Richard. Diane, thank you. Thank you, no problem, Richard. That's good. Can you say that in Dutch? Hartelijk bedankt. It was fijn om hier aanwezig te zijn. Can you say it again because we both coughed? Are you finished coughing? Sorry. Ha, can you say that in Dutch? Ben je klaar met hoesten? Ben je klaar met hoesten? 
What is that in English? It means, are you, have you finished coughing? <laughs> He'd ask me to say it in time. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to leave that in. I'm going to leave that in. <laughs> Joe, stop laughing. <laughs> Not going to happen. <laughs> Thank you for coming over, Joe. Thank All you, the Richard. way across the bridge. Mm-hmm. Indeed, as usual. As usual. And Dr. Rachie, of course, thank you so much for coming along. Oh, thanks. I'm Twittering. I wasn't listening. <laughs> You see why you can't do this in a vodcast? You can't do this in a vodcast. <laughs> Goodness me. She must, have read a, she must have read a funny Twitter. And, and you've been a very patient... I wish to just point out that that came out of the mouth. It did. You've been a very patient audience, uh, my friends. So until the next thing, thank you. Just... Yeah, you can all come back now. All right, here we go. <laughs> this is Eugenie Scott, National Center for Science Education. You can find us at www.ncse.com. Come see us if you want to know anything about the creationism and evolution conflict in the United States or more's the pity internationally these days. We are a clearinghouse for information on this vexing but certainly very interesting problem. Come and find out more about it. Thank you for listening to The Skeptic Zone. And once again, thank you for everybody who's writing in, letting me know what you're doing while listening to The Skeptic Zone. A lot of people are driving at the moment. Uh, yeah, take care. You might run into uh, people who are listening to us on their uh, iPods as they're jogging. Wouldn't that be something? And a special, uh, special shout-out to all those people who can't sleep right now. Sitting up in bed, sitting on your couch, eyes wide open, wishing you could sleep, battling insomnia, but listening to us instead. I hope we send you to sleep. Until next week, this is Richard Saunders signing off from Sydney, Australia. You've been listening to The Skeptic Zone. Visit our website at www.skepticzone.tv for comments, contacts, and extra video reports. The Skeptic Zone.